Right, I'll crack on straight away. And first off, I really apologise. I'm full of cold, and the first three rows, just so I can see, was to rinse splash. So, so um, I'll try not to cough or sneeze. Um, and also, it's, it's leaked back at university. There's been a minor problem. Oh, sorry, no, don't, don't worry. So, I'm going to talk about living class emotions and heritage in the post dream era. Essentially, what I'm going to talk about is how heritage and the emotions that we feel about heritage in the past can be tapped into by post-truth rhetoric to encourage nationalism, exceptionalism and conflict. So first off, it's, it's, it's a theoretical paper with uh, a little bit of early results from, from studies done. So we'll talk about the early results later on. But first, a little bit about what, what post-truth actually is. And post-truth is something uh, that is seemingly new in our political spec in our political dialogue. Encouraged by social media and the 24 hours news cycle, the need to have things out there are constantly um, <laughs> constantly out there without any kind of verification and it can spread around so much quicker than it had before. It's not necessarily just about political lying and fake news. We all know that people have lied, politi politicians have lied for countless centuries. But what makes this different, it tags into that social media, the 24 hour news cycle, it's that imagery that people use with these lies as well. And, and unfortunately, it seems that there's been a growing disregard for the truth amongst the majority of the population. And I don't, don't really know why that is. It seems, uh, a bit strange that it's like that, but it is. And identities and narratives are based on emotionally generated and held facts. So it's not necessarily facts that we would recognize them. They're born from emotion. Emotion keeps them there and they filter out facts that come in from alter alternative facts, if you like. And here just a uh, Factual claims are judged according to their emotional and ideological consistency. So if facts come into the environment, into a person's environment that don't reach with their emotional and ideological consistency, then they are not considered <laughs> facts. So we can see that in climate change debate. We know that 97% of climate scientists agree that there is going to be some kind of climate catastrophe. But if it doesn't fit into your emotional and our ideological consistency, and people just won't believe those facts presented by scientists. And so moving on a bit more to heritage and the past, emotional connections to the past through heritage places help people create their own narratives about the past. So people go to heritage places, they think about the past, they engage in nostalgic expressions about the past and they create their own narratives of what the past looked like. It's not necessarily what the past was, but it's what they think and what they feel the past was. And the type of heritage they go to, the interpretation <coughs> of the heritage, or lack of interpretation, depending on where you are, and their preconceptions of the past will all influence these emotional connections. So it's about how they've been introduced to the past before, they'll come in and they'll have preconceptions already which will filter through the stuff that they're being told in the heritage place. And this emotional narrative brings the past to life in a present, in the present, so if the past becomes part of someone's present, they use it to make decisions. And that's what I call the, the living past, the personal living past. And how, how is that affected by post-truthism? Um, the personal living past in the present starts to act in post-truth ways of filtering out elements of the past that this person doesn't agree with. Filters out those facts that we were talking about earlier. Also filter out elements of the present which do not conform to that political and social construct, so that idea of nationalism. You can use the person's past, they're using their past to filter out things that will combat that idea of nationalism. Um, and the post-truth rhetoric obviously looks to strengthen certain political and social constructs based on nationalism and exceptionalism. 
So what constructs would a living past based on today's heritage actually look like? And that's when I come into the early stage of the, uh, the results coming <coughs> from. But essentially the methods are, it's a mass data collection from TripAdvisor. So seven categories of heritage sites, 35 sites in all, 35,000 reviews in total, all across England. Um, and I get the beautiful job of going through them. Um, let me say 100% of TripAdvisor reviews mention parking. <laughs> um, and there's also focus groups of historically interested individuals. And that includes these historical interested individuals in include users of TripAdvisor sites. So if I find an interesting review that is emotionally based, that is political based or socially based, then I'll go back and I'll message them and ask them for a conversation and a survey comes from there as well. <laughs> and also a review of political commentary. I get asked why November 2019, because there's going to be a separate chapter about this election. <laughs> so November 2019 is where the data stops, but there is also an amendment at the end. And does it show heritage is constructing and enforcing constructs? And does the political commentary use these to persuade? Those are the two kind of basic questions I'm trying to answer. And the early, early results, just based on my, my own view of freedom, I've done early analysis on a few sites, but there is significant emotional attachment. So people are coming to TripAdvisor and using it as an online guestbook, and they're expressing emotion about the sites that they're going to. They're bringing the past to life on the page in TripAdvisor. Now, these are only a few sites. One of them is a place called Eden Camp, which I'm going to talk about. One of them is Avery Stone Circle. So you can kind of imagine there's maybe more emotion in these places. So will it be reciprocated at other kinds of sites? And, but heritage places do seemingly become places where political and social constructs, nationalism, exceptionalism, can be formed, reformed, so people can go to these places and reconnect to their ideals and they can be expressed at these heritage sites. And so Eden Camp, uh, it's in Malton, just by York. It's, it's a very, very interesting museum based on an Italian prisoner of war camp. It's still got the prefabricated uh, house, it huts that house the uh, prisoners of war. But the museum has decided to do a social military history of the country. Uh, from about 1940 to the Falklands War. As you can see, it's all about recreation. This down here is the hut, and you can also see that it's also about the living, like history animals as well. People go there a lot, dress up, uh, there's a lot of festivals, etc. <coughs> and here, about 12%, so uh, about 120 of the 1,000 reviews, had some kind of political connection to them. So, this person here, Florida 1999, shows what a strong country we are. So that person is using Eden Camp to demonstrate that we are still a strong country today. Every millennial should see this attraction and find the true meaning of the word hardship. A lot of people were bringing in uh, generational divides all through this. Uh, a lot of people saying, well, you don't, what, what, what would happen if you didn't have your phone or your laptop, etc. And then this one at the bottom, excellent and eclectic clutter, I thought this is going well, which will have you singing, who do you think you are killing Mr. Hitler if you think old England's done? So it's clear that people are using this place to kind of confirm their own realities about the world. And uh, I think what I'll do is I'll leave that there. Thank you.